Hi everyone, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Jennifer Gagnon with the Forest Landowner Education Program at Virginia Tech. Today I'm joining you from Ketlin Farm. Ketlin Farm is an 1800 acre property that is owned and managed by Virginia Tech and it's about 10 miles outside of the main campus in Blacksburg. Blacksburg is in Montgomery County in Southwest Virginia. Today I'm joined by two special guests from Virginia Tech. First, I have John McGee. John is a Geospatial Extension Specialist and Professor in the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation. And Daniel Cross is an Unmanned Aerial Vehicle Specialist and Geospatial Analyst at the Conservation Management Institute. And today they're gonna to teach us about drones or unmanned aerial vehicles and how they can be used in forest management. So the drone, it's just a vehicle. And when we talk about a drone, a drone could actually be you know, it could be a boat, it could be uh, a, a, a vehicle that runs along the terrain, like a, a little car or something, or it could be something in the air. All three of those are, are drones. But we're talking today about uncrewed aerial vehicles, and typically here at Virginia Tech we use what's called a small uncrewed aircraft system, which is any drone that's less than 55 pounds in size. And even a small drone of two or three pounds, it can collect a lot of data. You know, you have small cameras on them um, and, or sensors, and it's these sensors that are collecting data while the drone is flying. These are two examples of uncrewed aerial vehicles, also commonly known as drones. We use two different types of drones in our work collecting remotely sensed data. We use rotary wing vehicles, such as this quadcopter at EGI Mavic 3, and we use fixed wing vehicles such as this Sensefly EDX. We use the two different types of drones for different missions, as each type of drone has different strengths and different weaknesses. A multi-rotor vehicle such as this one is able to take off and land vertically as well as hover. This allows us to work in tight locations and it allows us to shoot videos of stationary objects uh, such as bald eagle nests. The advantage of the fixed wing drone is endurance. Uh, it can fly two to three times longer than a similar sized rotary wing vehicle, uh, which allows us to map up to 700 acres depending on the type of terrain uh, we're flying. Uh, that equates to approximately 45 minutes to an hour of flight time as compared to this Mavic, which can only fly for about 25 minutes and maybe map a few hundred acres. There are many different types of sensors that can be mounted onto drones. The most basic and probably the most common is the true color or RGB camera, uh, which is to say it's the camera we're all used to. Uh, these can range from anything like a GoPro duct taped onto the bottom of the drone all the way up to very expensive and very complex specialized systems. We can use this type of sensor for videography we can use it for taking individual images of a subject of interest. Uh, we can also use many of them combined together to make an ortho mosaic uh, that we can then use in a CAD program or into GIS. This allows us to make maps using uh, what is normally considered an ultra high resolution, sometimes as fine as a individual centimeter or potentially even less if you're willing to get your drone that close to the ground. We can also use this type of imagery for basic inspection such as mapping damage from this tornado in Rocky Mount, Virginia. Uh, we can also use it for automated classifications and to an extent we can even use it for 3D modeling. The next step up from an RGB sensor is a multispectral sensor. Uh, now, multispectral sensors are usually clusters of cameras uh, where each individual sensor is designed to collect information from a very uh, narrow, specified part of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, usually something on the range of maybe 20 to 50 nanometers wide. We can then calibrate that imagery uh, by collecting information about what the ambient sunlight was like so that we can then measure how the light interacted with materials on the ground by the light that's reflecting off it back into the sensor. 
This will allow us to see things that we wouldn't normally be able to see with either the naked eye or with an RGB image. This can include things like um, basic species identification uh, based on the amount of chlorophyll in an image or on a, in the vegetation. Uh, it can include things like uh, very basic levels of uh, soil moisture measurements. And then there are numerous ways we can combine these different bands together to create indices. So these allow us to, de to detect characteristics of objects on the surface of the Earth, such as minerals or vegetation, that we wouldn't normally be able to detect. Uh, an example of this is NDVI, which stands for Normal Normalized Differential Vegetation Index. Um, on the right, we have an NDVI image of a plot that had recently been harvested in southwest Virginia. So what we're seeing here are two different things. Uh, in part, we're looking at the differences in vegetation and to a mild extent vegetation types. Um, as compared to bare earth, and we're also looking at a very relative um, measurement of the vigor or stress of the vegetation. Now, NDVI is simply one of many different types of indices. There are numerous ways that we can combine different segments or bands of the electromagnetic spectrum together to detect uh, different attributes of vegetation. The next step up from multispectral sensor is a hyperspectral sensor. Now, whereas a multispectral sensor might detect uh, between 2 and 10 bands or segments of the electromagnetic spectrum, a hyperspectral sensor will detect several hundred bands that are only a few nanometers wide, so they're very specific and very select. This has a lot of uses in research. Uh, where we can do things like uh, attempt to monitor um, how difference is in the balance of chlorophyll and other chemicals within the canopy can affect things like uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, however, they're generally not practical for um, professional or industrial use as they are fairly cost prohibitive and they're incredibly data intensive. Now, another thing that drones have done in the remote sensing world is that it's made 3D modeling far more affordable and accessible for the average user. Uh, because of the high detail and the very high overlap of the imagery that we're collecting from drones, we're able to use photogrammetric methods to create 3D point clouds, make 3D models of uh, things like canopy. Um, in this instance, this is an image of a 3D model of fish burn. Uh, that was created using a standard off-the-shelf consumer-grade drone and the standard RGB camera that came with it. Models like this can be used for things like looking at the texture of the canopy, at least on a very surface level, uh, as well as for 3D um, volumetric analysis. Uh, however, it has one major limitation, and that's that it cannot penetrate through any type of material, be that canopy or any shorter vegetation. And that's why this model has these very large white gaps in it. Uh, the, very, the big white gap in the center of the image is actually um, the forest edge, where the canopy overhung the forest edge to the point uh, that from the camera's perspective up on the drone several hundred feet up, it simply didn't collect enough imagery of the tree trunks and the undergrowth there to include in the model. The next step in 3D modeling is using LiDAR, which uses laser pulses to measure distance from the sensor very rapidly. Uh, your average area LiDAR sensor can collect uh, many thousands of uh, measurements each second. Now, LiDAR itself is not a particularly new technology and has been used um, for aircraft, for forestry, uh, for many years now. However, the miniaturization of LiDAR in the past few years has allowed us to mount them to drones, which allows us to get the sensor significantly closer to the canopy. This allows us to take uh, or to collect ultra high density point clouds uh, of forest, um, allowing us to model things that we've never been able to see before, such as canopy structure, even down to the limbs and twigs of trees. 
And since LiDAR is able to penetrate canopy and get multiple returns, we're able to create a 3D model looking down through a leaf on the canopy. So in the lower image, we see a profile of LiDAR flown from a drone. And we can see the canopy, the tree trunks, the undergrowth, and even the ground. Um, comparing that to the uh, photogrammetric source on top, where the only thing we can see is the very surface of the canopy. Uh, the only place that we can see anything beyond that is where there are gaps in the canopy. Now, the major disadvantage of LiDAR is that uh, they are still relatively expensive, uh, particularly compared to a standard RGB camera. Um, and often they do require more expensive heavy lift drones to operate. So typically, when considering a drone purchase, it's good to, to think backwards. Uh, because there are different drones that do different, that, that are supported for different applications. Uh, some drones have, you know, true color sensors on them. Some drones have near infrared sensors on them. And typically these sensors are not easily interchangeable from one drone to the other. So you need to identify what your needs are before running out and purchasing a drone. And you also need to identify and realize that there's a lot of work that happens before flying a drone and a lot of work that happens after operating a drone. So it's not just flying the drone, that's not the, the really the hard part of, of, of the drone operation workflow. This is really a transformative technology that's it's kind of taking uh, mapping by storm. You know, in the past, if we wanted to map a forest or basically any landscape, we would have to uh, hire a, an airplane, get a pilot, you know, schedule a flight in the future. And frankly, it was pretty expensive. You know, now we can just wait for a beautiful sunny day like today. Um, and we can pull the drone out of our car, do some flight planning and some safety inspections and we're basically ready to fly and collect data. One of the challenges with drones and forestry applications is with the regulatory environment. The Federal Aviation Administration stipulates that you have to keep your drone within the line of sight at all times. So in, uh, for, for typical crops in agriculture, this isn't an issue. But with forestry, we can typically see the drone over the, kind of the first line of trees but after it gets beyond kind of that first line, you know, we lose sight of it. So therefore we'd be, um, we'd be outside of the regulatory framework. And of course, this is, these, uh, these regulations are starting to evolve and we anticipate that sometime in the future, which could be a few years, um, that we, would, we will be able to operate a drone outside or beyond uh, the visual line of sight. And finally, I think the, probably the most important uh, issue to consider is if you are flying a drone for commercial reasons, um, and then you need to have what's called a remote pilot certification, which is administered through the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, so remote pilot certification is especially relevant for uh, operators who are going to fly a drone for commercial reasons. And for example, you know, I work at Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a commercial operator in one sense, because I don't run a company, but because I'm using a drone uh, with my work, I have to have my remote pilot certification. So basically drones are helping us to, to grow crops, to manage our lands more efficiently and effectively while also minimizing inputs and saving landowners money. Well, thank you for spending 15 minutes in the forest with us, and thanks to John and Daniel for sharing their 
knowledge in teaching us about drones and unmanned aerial vehicles and using them in forest management. Be sure to join us again in two weeks for another edition of 15 Minutes in the Forest.